Hi there, folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Zivna Kojima again. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you with us. And a great big thank you to everyone who joined us yesterday for the Fukuoka Black Lives Matter March. It was great to see such a huge turn up, especially since about a third or so of the people were actually Japanese, which was a very pleasant surprise for me. Um, Japanese are usually shy to take up vocal public causes, let alone causes that originate in other countries. So it was really great to see the uh, movement struck a chord with so many locals as well. I went with my son, who's 11 years old, and just walking around the park and reading the posters that were up there on the trees um, with the names and the ages of some of the people who died and especially the circumstances around their deaths, that really had a profound effect on him. Um, just growing up mostly in Japan, being surrounded mostly by Japanese. Um, and we do have a close-knit foreigner community that we hang out with, of course, uh, but that naturally includes people of all colors and races. So aside from the occasional culture clash that he's personally experienced, just looking, you know, not 100% Japanese, but not really related to anything aside from just generally being associated with foreigners. So the idea to him that anyone could be even more specifically singled out and have their rights abused just by virtue of their uh, skin color or looks, that was a big eye opener for him. Um, and that, for me, uh, very selfishly, was really significant uh, from an education perspective. And the march itself was very peaceful. The vast majority of the people we passed by were supportive, and many of them held up signs and shouted encouragement as well. Uh, the police were with us all the way, keeping us safe from traffic. And if there were any counter demonstrations, um, which is often the case, they must have kept them totally separate because we haven't seen any signs of those. So. Yes, big thank you again to everyone who participated and another big round of hugs and support to our sisters and brothers in the US and anywhere else in the world who are still fighting against oppression, discrimination and abuse. Hang in there. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It'll just take a bit longer, but we'll get there together. Now, speaking of foreigners and cultural clashes, for today's episode, I thought we'd run through some of the things which are vastly different here in Japan when conducting property purchases and then management of properties in case of rental or other investment properties. And I don't mean different in the obvious sense of language, types of documents involved and so forth. And um, obviously there are practical differences there and we touched upon uh, a lot of them in the past. Uh, I'm more referring to the um, subtle psychological differences and differences in communication style and business related habits which, uh, while in other countries are easily worked around with some mutual statements from both sides, um, people just clarify their intent and then they can get around these kinds of things. Here, they can very easily, and they often do, uh, make or break a deal, uh, mainly from the Japanese side. And not only that, but they also make or break a relationship. So if you recall, we always mentioned that the amount of property professionals, uh, such as realtors and property managers, uh, renovation, repair professionals, etc., the percentage of those professionals who can and will work with foreigners is severely limited in Japan, particularly once you get out of Tokyo and Niseko, Osaka, and the rest of the more internationally minded uh, Japanese metropolitan centers. Uh, which, to be honest, are not that international to begin with. So again, even in Tokyo, you'll find maybe a dozen or so uh, realtors and property management companies who can and will provide services in English and work with foreigners. And they'll also cover neighboring cities in some cases, like Yokohama, Chiba, etc. And in Osaka, maybe half a dozen or so, probably less. And they'll probably service Kobe or Kyoto or some other neighboring cities. In other major cities like Fukuoka or Nagoya, not even that. So two or three companies, if you're lucky. And forget about smaller townships, right? So places like Nagasaki, Kumamoto, Hiroshima, etc. Now, that's obviously an issue because some of these smaller cities are where the best deals can often be found, uh, as far as rental yields are concerned, at least. And even in the bigger cities, if you can only work with a fraction of the companies available on the market, you can obviously face some issues that, that just derive from the lack of diversity and choice in properties, and diversity and choice in professionals to work with, and also just simple lack of compatibility, right? So you might not get along with that particular person in charge or their staff, or they may not be too keen on working the way you like to work uh, or to facilitate the type of purchases that you might be interested in, uh, either because these properties are too cheap for them to invest too much time in researching for you and facilitating the sale, or just because they themselves find it harder to deal with the uh, specific sellers or realtors representing the sellers because uh, they're foreigners themselves, etc., etc. So a lot of issues which wouldn't be that much of a problem if you had access to the entire market. 
meaning to standard Japanese property professionals, regardless of whether they provide services in English or are okay working with foreigners or not. Now, if you've already got a local English-speaking realtor or property management company, etc., that you're comfortable working with, and you're only operating in one or two of these major cities or one or two locations, that might not be a problem for you. And if you're working nationwide through a buyer's agent portfolio management company like ourselves here at NTI, that's also not going to be an issue. But for those among you who do speak and read and write Japanese fluently enough, and you do want to work directly with realtors and property managers, and you do want to get quotes uh, and order work and supervise renovation and repair work directly, uh, either because you're a DIY type of investor or just because uh, you want to cut the middleman and you don't mind spending the time and handling the learning curve on your own, you're probably going to pretty quickly run into some stumbling blocks that have to do with these cultural and mannerism gaps. And this is doubly true if you're actually an experienced investor overseas and you've got your own ways of working and your own routines that you used to. The problem is that many of those uh, work processes and uh, routines don't actually work here in Japan. And not only do they not work, they can also harm you and damage your relationship with those professionals uh, to a point where they'll simply refuse to work with you again. They'll start ghosting you, avoiding your calls, emails, etc., which is you know, not a nice experience emotionally, but more importantly, it really throws off your game in an environment that doesn't really offer that many options uh, for foreigners to begin with. So you want to avoid making these mistakes from the get-go if you're dealing directly with these companies to ensure the best chance of success long-term and to maintain just you know, the highest possible availability of companies that you can actually work with and choose to work with uh, for whatever, for purchase, management, maintenance, whatever it is that you need. So here are some things to avoid uh, if you're working directly with traditional Japanese property professionals. Now, again, if you're working with companies that cater specifically to foreigners, not a problem, whether they're realtors, property managers, or other professionals. And, of course, if you're working, again, with buyers, agents, portfolio managers like ourselves. So these companies are probably used to the little odds and ends that we're going to discuss here. And they would either accommodate your wishes or they would, you know, gently inform you or guide you in the right direction in case you happen to step on any administrative toes or otherwise, you know, request the impossible. But if you're dealing with a proper, normal Japanese property company, you want to avoid these practices well in advance. So these um, practices in no particular order um, are as follows. So the first thing, and we've mentioned this time and time again here, realtors in particular, but all other professionals as well, in Japan they are not used to dealing with tire kickers, and foreigners unfortunately have a reputation of being exactly that. So bear in mind you're starting on the left foot and you really need to assure whoever it is that you're communicating with that you're serious. So this means everything, right? From submitting inquiries, asking for information, estimates and other data, and then failing to return emails or calls without any explanation, you know, simply because you've lost interest. You do that once or twice and that particular company uh, will stop returning your messages and they'll most likely let everyone else in the company know to do the same because you're obviously a time waster. Now, overseas, in most countries at least, uh, there's a general assumption that realtors are sales hounds, right? That they're always eager to offload properties and they'll happily keep answering questions and suggesting more and more properties. If they don't get this one, they'll make the next sale. They reply to inquiries endlessly and they'll basically chase the buyer until they convince them to buy something. This is not the case in Japan. And it's most definitely not the case uh, when the potential buyer is a foreigner. So if you've received a reply to your inquiry with any kind of information in it, and the person at the other end has established a line of communication with you, you really want to keep that relationship polite and alive. So if you've decided not to proceed with your inquiry for any reason, you want to apologize, you want to inform them that you've decided not to proceed with this investigation or with that purchase. Make sure to include the reason why you've chosen not to do so. And bear in mind that if that reason is something like, um, I've decided not to buy now or I've decided to go for another property, something general like that, you'll only be able to get away with that one once, if that. Once you go that route a second time, and often the first time will do, you will again be labeled a time waster, tire kicker, and they'll just stop responding to any future attempts from you to contact them. Or they might respond, but they'll politely shake you off. So if you've received some serious due diligence information from the listing realtor and you find something that you don't like, that's a different story. You still want to properly explain why you're choosing not to proceed and you want to mention that you'll be very happy to receive other similar properties which might be more attractive on that particular criteria um, that you've earmarked as being less than ideal. 
So that will make you look and sound serious, and you'll probably continue to receive potential listings or estimates. Same goes for renovation repair companies, right? If they've provided you with an estimate and you chose not to go ahead with an renovation, reply, explain, apologize, which will keep you on the good side. And you might even hear back from them with a discounted price or with another option that would somehow reduce the overall price. But if you just ask for information and then disappear or sign off with a simple no thanks and you know no, no proper explanation, you're most likely going to be blacklisted by the company, which is not a good idea in a market that's, again, already extremely foreigner shy to begin with. Okay, so the next big mistake that many of us make. Um, we often assume that we can make things work in a more convenient way. Even when the Japanese parties involved have explained to us that the annoying way in which things need to be done, um, which might seem terribly inefficient and pedantic to us, is the only way that it can happen, and this is something that we see all the time from new clients until they finally wrap their heads around the fact that there is no other way. Uh, there's no way around these facts of life. And here you have to understand that even in cases when the realtor and the property lawyer and the property manager and the renovation and repair company, they're all open-minded and cutting edge and modern and they want to work with foreigners like yourself, they still have to deal with super old school government departments like the Legal Affairs Bureau who handles you know, property ownership transactions and transfer, uh, the local tax department, the local municipality and the building management companies. And all of these other third parties simply will not budge an inch from the way they expect things to be done. So it doesn't matter that you think a signature you know, with a fuzzy mobile phone shot of your passport should do the trick. It won't. There has to be a particular document stating particular words and phrases, which has to be witnessed by particular witnesses with particular official stamps or seals that have to bear particular registration IDs and so forth. So no, the clerk at the Legal Affairs Bureau doesn't care that there's an English website somewhere out there which shows the registration idea of that particular lawyer who signed as a witness as a document and that you've printed out the web page for them to review. For one, they probably can't read English. Secondly, they can't and will not access the internet on your behalf to check on that registration, even if they could read that web page. And lastly, they've been instructed by their bosses that if there's a big red stamp on the document that has a big red registration ID, the document is acceptable. And if there isn't, it's not. Period. This will not change. Right? So the same goes for other um, simpler procedures along the way. So no, you cannot review the rent roll and the structural renovation history before submitting an offer on the property because nobody will start bugging the seller to supply all of that, uh, nor will they pay the 50 bucks or so that they need to pay the building management company to produce that data for you. You know, just for some unknown foreigner who thinks that they might or might not want to submit an offer after they provide this information. Um, just because there will be another buyer, probably Japanese, far less of a hassle, far fewer questions, and they'll be knocking on their door within a day or two. Um, no, you're not allowed to fill in the day of settlement in advance on your purchase document uh, that's supposed to go to City Hall. Even though it seems weird to leave it blank because the Legal Affairs Bureau clerk, again, is expecting to be able to stamp his little date stamp on that little field on the day of settlement, whenever that ends up being. And yes, you need to sign twice on the same page, one signature below the other, even though it's not the way things are done in English legal documents in the West, because that's how it's done here. And this carries on to property management and to any other professional that you're working with post-settlement as well. So you might not like the quality of the photos that they've taken after a tenant moved out. You might not like the terms that they suggest to advertise under when they search for the next tenant. You might not like the way in which they provide their monthly statements, uh, think scanning or faxing. You might think that their ideas on what should be done with the property renovation wise um, to attract more potential tenants more quickly. You might think their ideas are less creative than yours and that you can do much better, but you're probably wrong. Not because your way doesn't work, but because it doesn't work in Japan or it doesn't work in that particular area or with this particular property profile, etc., etc., etc. So don't feel bad about it either. It's perfectly understandable. Um, I've made many of these same mistakes myself, actually, when I was just getting started with my own portfolio here. And I thought I've seen it all because I've owned and managed properties in other countries. And that approach quickly came back to bite me on the bum. So if you're regular listeners, you might remember the interview I gave to uh, my biggest investment mistake, uh, the other podcast a while back. Uh, if not, I'll link to that episode in the show notes. But I've been lucky enough on that occasion to have only lost a tenant and you know some income and not lose my relationship with that particular realtor. 
Actually, I should amend that. It wasn't a matter of uh, me being lucky, but a matter of having a super professional business partner working with me, uh, who also happens to be my very talented, smart, and beautiful wife, Chikako. So thanks to her, we did manage to keep that particular property manager on board, which was very fortunate because there are not many reliable ones in that particular location. But those among you doing this uh, on your own really need to try and listen to the professionals that you're working with. And again, it's okay to ask why, and it's okay to ask how, and it's okay to ask if it's possible to do it cheaper, and if it's possible to do it another way. But try to avoid assuming that you know better, or that your way will work better, or that it's okay to enforce your way on the people who are there to make things work in the environment that they know far better than you do because it won't, and you might end up losing a valuable contact in the process of this trial and error, which, again, in a country where companies agreeing to work with foreigners are the exception rather than the norm, that's even more of a valuable contact than it is in any other country. Okay, what else should you avoid doing? Um, you really want to avoid being pushy, right? So things in Japan tend to move at a very frustrating glacial pace for many foreigners, and believe me, this pace doesn't become any less frustrating with time. Again, I'm fortunate in this regard to have a talented and experienced partner who absorbs my pesky prods and tells me, um, quite firmly I should add, to just wait. But again, if we keep pushing and pushing and prodding and inquiring and asking the professional on the other side of that line to hurry up, even though they've already told us that whatever it is we're waiting for will take more time, again, we stand to lose that contact. So it is okay to follow up, of course, and it is okay to check on progress, but this needs to be done within reason and within the time frames already agreed upon in advance. So if you've ordered a renovation, say, for a property and the renovation company mentioned it would take three weeks, there's really no point whatsoever in sending them uh, three requests for progress reports once a week and please include photos of each and every phase of the work that you're doing there. And all of this for a renovation or a repair project, you know, maybe just cost a thousand bucks or so. That's a sure recipe of not being able to ever work with that particular company again. And probably with the property manager who organized the work as well, because they won't be interested in putting their work contacts in this situation as well. Now, lastly, and I just mean lastly for this episode, because we could really go on forever and ever on this topic, but we have to stop somewhere. Lastly, there's a matter of handling documents. So again, something we've mentioned here on quite a few occasions, but it bears repeating again in this context. Japanese are obsessed with paperwork. And not only with paperwork, but with the right way to handle the paperwork. So you and I might think it's silly. I know I definitely do. But sloppy paperwork creates in their mind a sloppy image of the person who submitted that paperwork. And that applies to all the things that we used to seeing as normal in many countries, especially in Western countries or in the Middle East, where I'm originally from. Documents which are printed on dirty or crinkled or folded bits of paper and, you know, stuffed into envelopes that are obviously too small to hold them without folding them. Uh, stamps or seals from various overseas authorities that are partly legible or unreadable. Um, addresses or names or dates written in the wrong place or omitting a middle name or omitting a, a state or omitting a, a number in the address and then crossing it over, you know, with or without a signature next to it, doesn't matter. These might be accepted in some cases and by some companies or authorities. They might not be accepted in other cases. And they will, regardless of whether they let it fly or not, they will mark you in their minds as a messy, sloppy person, which for the average Japanese mind translates automatically into unreliable. Fair or not, silly or not, it's just the way it is. And again, I'm speaking out of painful personal experience here. Trust me on this. I'm exactly the same way when it comes to documents. My handwriting is a disaster. I scratch things out. I reiterate them. It's in my nature. But I do try to limit this tendency of mine because it's just not done here, for better or worse. Same applies to meetings, by the way. If you're meeting someone face-to-face, -face, a Japanese professional, the whole Silicon Valley type look simply doesn't work here. So no jeans, no t-shirts, no sneakers and loafers. You don't have to wear a suit and a tie, but you'd better have a proper pair of pants and a buttoned shirt on. Again, they won't say anything, but you stand a far higher chance of losing the deal and or the relationship simply because in their eyes you're sloppy, which again means unreliable, and that for them points to potential trouble down the road. And it goes on and on. Negotiation, negotiation is okay, but aggressive negotiation, you know, whether via aggressive numbers or via emotional outbursts, generally speaking, emotional outbursts of any kind are severely frowned upon in Japan. And that's another sure way of burning a relationship. These are not acceptable. Um, 
visiting someone's office without making an appointment, also frowned upon. Demanding as opposed to asking, you know, as self-glorification and promises of future financial gains are considered snobby and rude here, right? So none of that, hey, I'm a big investor and I got a lot of cash, or now listen here, I know all there is to know about tenants and how to handle them, or no, you're doing this all wrong. This type of banter, which is often part and parcel of business communication in other countries, particularly when we're the customer and we believe that we're always right, that simply won't fly in Japan. And that'll cost you your relationships again and again and again. So again, the main thing to keep in mind here is that no, money doesn't always talk. And that's strictly opposed to what we may be used to in other countries. Social and professional norms, the proper way of doing things, um, smooth operations, lack of friction and conflict here are far more important than monetary gain, as strange as it may sound to the typical uh, non-Japanese ear. And really, a Japanese professional won't bat an eyelid before refusing to do business with those who don't follow these guidelines. And let me emphasize one last time, here, as opposed to other countries, it's a lot harder to find somebody who will take your money and agree to work with you. So you really want to keep that in mind before, during, and after any interaction, particularly with new business contacts. Once you've done a few deals together and you're both used to each other's you know, strange foreign ways, things are, of course, easier. But at the start, it's much better to err on the side of caution and do things the way that your business partner expects them to be done just to make sure that the relationship takes off on the right foot and generates the result that you're looking for in the long term. Now, I keep asking you folks to post some reviews and ratings, and I promise to read some of these, so here's the first little snippet. Uh, this one comes from a listener in the USA, and she or he writes, for anybody interested in investing in the Japanese real estate market, this is the only podcast available and the emphasized only. Even though most of the episodes are usually short, about 15 minutes, the host deep dives into the various investing conditions unique to the Japanese market, offers a lot of practical advice and various aspects that investors need to think about when investing in properties while being an absentee landlord. He also interviews a lot of professionals in the field who offer different perspectives on real estate investing. The only complaint that I have is that I wish the podcast episodes were either longer or published more than once a week, more frequently than once a week. So thank you for that one, um, anonymous uh, reviewer. And yes, I do realize the podcast could be longer. You might have noticed we're trying to move that way whenever possible, but since this is not a monetized podcast or anything of the sort, just done as a service and of course also for us to get out there and in front of people uh, branding wise. So there's a limit to how much time and effort I can put into it at this stage at least without harming our normal business operations. So apologies for that. And again, thank you for the review. That was a five star review. So like most of them, but we greatly appreciate all of them. Please keep them coming. Okay, so that's it from us for today, folks. We hope to have you with us again next time. This has been NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm Ziv Nakajima again. Our theme song is by Kevin Hartnell, and we would love it if you could share this podcast with your networks and help us reach more people who may benefit from it. And of course, we'd be eternally grateful if you could take a moment of your time and leave us a short rating or review like this extremely polite and wonderful person that you've just heard from did. Your word of mouth is what keeps us going, and that helps us reach more and more people who can hopefully benefit from the content we put out. We hope to have you with us again next time, and until then, from all of us here at NTI, Yoshiku!